Welcome back, guys. I'm on with an interview with a best-selling author today. Richard Chismar is stopping by. He's the best-selling author of Wendy's Button Box, co-authored with Stephen King. The sequel to that book, Wendy's Magic Feather, authored without Stephen King in Castle Rock. He's also the author of Widow's Point, The Girl on the Porch, A Long December, and The Long Way Home. He also edits anthologies, produces films, writes screenplays, and teaches writing. Wow, he's an accomplished guy. Richard, thanks for dropping by, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. So before we get into your work with Stephen King, you have a publication called Cemetery Dance Publications. You can just give us some background, a little bit about that. Yeah, I started, uh, I was at the University of Maryland back in 1988, it was my last year. And um, I was writing short stories and submitting them all around the small press. And, and back then there was like this whole network of smaller magazines, unlike now where there's just a handful and there's some online publications. Back then there was this huge network of, of small press mags um, ranging in quality from from pretty crappy to, uh, to you know, much nicer and slicker like uh, the horror show and iniquities. And, and uh, you can find these things on eBay now. They're like little, uh, you know, <laughs> treasures, antiques. Um, I still have shelves full of them, but, uh, I decided to start my own magazine. And, uh, so I started that when I was a senior at college and, uh, worked on that for a couple of years. And then we expanded into hardcover books and, and it just kind of picked up from there. But yeah, I, I, uh, I never went out and got a job after college. I just started the magazine and accepted the fact that I was going to be poor for, you know, a decade <laughs> or so. And, uh, that was, that's what happened, but yeah, we're still kicking after 30 years. That's really awesome. You know, I appreciate that kind of work because things are in ways dying in the literary world, especially now that they aren't using paper to print many things. Now, you, now with Cemetery Dance, you guys have published a lot of hardcover fiction books from Stephen King, Dean Kuntz, Peter Straub. Can you can you tell us maybe some other people that you've worked with in Cemetery Dance? Um, you know what, after 30 years, we've, we've worked with most of most everyone at one point or another, whether they've appeared in one of our anthologies or whether we've published a, a book, you know, with their name on the cover by themselves, whether it be a collection or a novel or, or, uh, or a novella. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we've published, I should know, um, but I don't, but I, I, <laughs> 400, 450 hardcover, something like that. Wow. Um, wow. You know, besides those those you know kind of larger names that you mentioned, as far as the bestsellers and and kind of the legends in the field, we were fortunate to be able to publish the the real legends, the the older guys like uh, who aren't who are no longer with us. Many of them, um, you know, Ray Bradbury, Richard Matheson, those guys, um, you know, the the folks who who you know wrote episodes of the Twilight Zone and and that kind of thing. So it, it yeah, I mean after uh 3 decades we we've been very fortunate that we've kind of have our finger, you know, our fingerprints a little bit of everywhere. You know, that's quite incredible. I actually have one of your publications here. After I researched Cemetery Dance, I ran over to myself and I confirmed that my Gwendy's button box mm -hmm. was put off uh by Cemetery Press. So let's get into your work with Stephen King. How did you come to meet him and get started with him? Well, going back to 1988 again, I you know I was a huge Stephen King fan when I started the magazine. Uh, right from the very beginning, I sent a copy of the first issue, sent him a copy of the second issue, and so on. Um, I would I would write notes up to the office and, and just say hey to his assistant and say hey I'd love if if he'll ever you know you know let us print a story whatever you know an interview. Um, typical you know just fan. Um, who was kind of dipping his toes into the field for the first time in a professional sense. And, uh, you know, I think somewhere around year two or three, he gave us a really nice promotional blurb, you know, something like Cemetery Dance is one of the best, blah, 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 you know, something we could use for advertising. Uh, very nice and, and, and generous on his part. Um, then in 91, year three, he sent us, for the 14th issue of Cemetery Dance, he sent us an original story called Chattery Teeth. Um, that was a huge, you know, uh, building block as, as far as the business was concerned. And then over the, you know, over the next decade, we worked with him a handful more times with other short stories, mainly reprints and, and different anthologies. And then the, for the very first time, um, I think it was around 2000 from a Buick 8, he, uh, he approached us and asked if we would want to do a limited edition of that book. And that really, 
you know, kind of instantly put us on the map as far as book publishing and um, worked with them a bunch, you know, after that. And at some point that that business relationship turned into a friendship. We, we have a lot in common as far as, you know, we're both family guys, um, obviously love books and movies, baseball fans, dogs, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I, I just think, you know, we have a lot of, uh, a lot in common and uh, it, it's cool how it developed into a friendship. We went to some baseball games together. We, I, you know, flew down and saw him in Florida a few times and yeah, just, just kind of a, a cool, uh, you know, surprise in my life. You know, when I was investigating for this interview, I think I saw a picture of you with King at a major league baseball game. I'm just mm -hmm. curious if you yourself are a Red Sox fan or who do you follow? No, I'm an Orioles fan. I'm a Baltimore okay. Orioles fan. Steve and I have had several, you know, they're both in the American league East, um, long time rivals, um, we've had quite a few season long bets, whoever ends up at, you know, with a higher winning percentage, um, that kind of thing. But yeah, that, that picture, um, I've been to a few ball games with them, but they've always been spring training games. Um, you know, his, his winter home is down there in Florida, not far from where the Orioles play, uh, in Sarasota. So yeah, a, a few times I've flown down there, we've grabbed a bite to eat, um, and, and caught a game and it's just, you know, a great time. We just laugh and and pick on each other's teams and uh, talk books and movies <laughs> and all the stuff that we, you know, usually text about. We, uh, you know, got to kind of get a chance to talk face to face. When I think Orioles, the first thing that comes to mind is Cal Ripken Jr. I was mm -hmm. actually watching the game that he played when he broke the record for most consecutive games played. I remember that when I was a kid. I watched that with my father. I'm personally a Cleveland Indians fan, yeah, uh, by the way. Yeah. See, I love the old American league East. You know, I, I still, uh, you know, Steve makes fun of me for being such a tradition. <laughs> and I, you know, to me, the American league East was, was Baltimore, New York, Boston, Cleveland, Detroit. And, you know, I, I grumbled when Toronto came on board, but got used to it, but you know, now it's chaos, you know, but yeah, I like the Indians. I like those guys. Yeah. You know, it can be tough being a Cleveland fan and uh, fan in general, but you know, I love them. Watched them ever since I was a kid. I've yeah. got a viewer question for you. I'd like to know why, or I'd like to know what the writing process was between himself and Stephen King. How did they split the work? You want to answer that one? Sure. Uh, well, on Button Box, it was it was pretty easy. I mean, uh, it's actually been easy on, on both books that we wrote together. But with Button Box, the, the way it came about um, was we were uh, we were emailing and and I was asking him about those round robin type projects where you have like you know, multiple authors involved. So there, it's not really a direct, it, it's not really a, 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 a basic collaboration that you might have six or eight or 10 or 12 authors and each one writes a chapter of a story. And they, they kind of became a, a thing, you know, a while back. There were, there were quite a few of them, especially in the mystery crime world. Um, and I was just asking his opinion and, and that got us talking about collaborations. And then Steve mentioned that he had a story that he had started that he would, he had never been able to finish. Um, that led one thing led to another. The next morning, he actually emailed it to me. And before I knew it, we were collaborating on it. Um, so that story, you know, he had written the first chunk of maybe 25 pages or so. Um, I just kind of picked up where he left off and ran with it and wrote a bunch more, sent him that. He wrote some, I wrote some, and then we finished. Um, and and we kind of just had, you know, there were no, no rules, no preset big discussion. We just said, Hey, you do your thing. I'll do mine. Nothing I write is sacred. Um, and back, you know, I rewrote some of his stuff, which, you know, I, I yeah, I, is, is slightly terrifying to think about. And, uh, he rewrote some of mine and, um, our voices kind of just blended because of it, I think. And, uh, yeah, so it was a simple, you know, Gwenny's button box, I think from the day I got the file to when we were finished and there, and we had to like, you know, do work on other projects at times was, it took us maybe a month. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, I really enjoyed Gwendy's button box. And by the way, guys, down in the description, I'll have a link for all of Richard's books and his website and everything that you need to investigate cemetery dance publications. So you have authored another book, Gwendy's magic feather, which is a direct sequel to button box and you author this one without Stephen King in Castle Rock. Can you tell us a little bit about that book? Absolutely. Um, 
Well, the first part of that story that is probably the most interesting is that I, I didn't know I was writing it by myself. I, I, I woke up one morning. I had an idea. We never discussed a sequel to Gwendy. People asked us um, in the press, you know, will there be a sequel? And, uh, you know, my answer always was, you know, kind of tongue in cheek. I'll do whatever the hell Steve wants me to do. Um, yeah. I'd love to do it again. It was, you know, we had a lot of fun. Um, Steve's response was always, I have no plans to do a sequel, but I also have don't have, you know, I, I'm not set against it. Um, but I woke up one morning with just a really clear picture in my head of what Gwendy Peterson was doing, you know, 10, 15 years down the road. I, for some reason, I just woke up and I knew, um, I had no intentions of writing the book. I wasn't pitching Steve to write a second book. I just, I woke up, I sent him an email at like 7 AM, went back to sleep for a little bit. And by the time I woke up again, got out of the shower, Steve had emailed me back and he said, this is a great idea. I'm going to be busy for the foreseeable future with, and I can't remember which book it was. Um, he said, but you, you need to write it. So I took that as, you know, Rich, you write the first pass and then I'll, I'll piggyback later and, uh, and do a pass and, and make you look really smart and really good. Um, but that's not what happened. He, and it wasn't his intentions, I guess, because when I sent him the finished first draft, he read it and he's like, this is great. You know, I see a spot or two. Um, you know, that we can sharpen up, but this is your story. This is all you, you know, do you want me to edit it? And I was like, Oh my God. So I never would have written. I never would have gone back to castle rock. You know, 90% of the novel takes place in castle rock. I bring back characters from other novels, like needful things like, uh, uh, you know, Sheriff Ridgewick, um, Norris Ridgewick's his name and, and some others. And, you know, I cover a lot of ground. Essentially, I bring Castle Rock back to life because at the end of Needful Things, it was destroyed. And this is the first novel set there since. So I never would have done all that if I didn't know Steve, if I didn't think Steve was coming on board. Um, yeah. So, yeah, one of those one of those kind of happy, crazy gifts. And I was a nervous wreck when he said it's all you. But uh, he gave me a very kind and generous edit and um, wrote a wonderful introduction to the book. And there you had it. So, yeah, I mean, it take magic feather takes place. I think around when button box ends, she just graduated college. So she's, you know, early twenties, uh, button box takes place. She's in her late thirties entering a, she's a writer and about to enter a completely different career, um, in politics, which I know very little about and I'm very, not very interested in, but like I said, I knew this is what she was doing. And, um, and that's that, you know, she goes back to Castle Rock for the winter break and bad things are happening in town. And uh, let's just say her and the button box get involved. So, that's yeah, too. When I think of King and other authors, there are three authors that I think of. One is Peter Straub because they authored The Talisman and Black House. I mm -hmm. wonder if that trilogy is ever going to be finished. Maybe you can give us some insight. Do you know anything about that? I know there were definite plans to finish it. Um, I know there were ideas and, and I don't, I don't know if there's an outline or anything like that, but I know they, yeah. they have an idea what they wanted to do with it. Peter's Peter had open heart surgery and he was in the hospital for months. And I do know thanks to social media. I mean, Peter and I are friends, but we don't, you know, we don't chat or anything. Um, but yeah. I did see on social media just last week that his daughter posted that Peter finally went home. So hopefully okay. he's he's on the mend and, and getting stronger. And uh, I think that'd be, you know, I, I personally, I couldn't, I, you know, I can't wait. Hopefully that does happen. Peter Straub wrote The Talisman and The Black House. And Black House is one of the three novels that I think are cornerstones of The Dark Tower. Mm -hmm. So Straub, in some sense, authors part of The Dark Tower series. And I really like that fact and you do as well because in Gwendy's button box there are some direct connections to the dark tower randall flag is one of those the gems that are in the button box is one of those and i think there are probably several more and the other author i think of i think of you straub and joe hill because hill writes in stephen king's main as well horns is in stephen king's main not far from Derry, i believe and mm -hmm. i think that maybe Maybe Nosferatu's in Stephen King's main, where we're inside the plot. Someone makes a mention that Castle Rock's not far right, off, right. something to that I effect. I think he has some mentions in The Fireman, too. Yeah. I read The Fireman, and that is right. Man, was that, you know what? I thought that that book was too long, and I had to push through to finish that one. Did you read the book? 
Yeah. Yeah. I know. I'm a big well, Joe Hill fan. What I liked about The Fireman is that it was loaded with literary references. I wish yeah. I would have wrote every one of them down when I was going through that thing. There must have been at least 50 literary yeah, references. Someone needs to write an article, an essay about that. I'd love to publish that, actually, in Cemetery Dance. It's a good idea. Yeah, that is a good idea because he kept dropping literary bombs all throughout that. And he especially was kind kind of paying homage to Stephen King. Uh, there are some elements of the stand that come up in that novel. And oh, yeah. I think that that was probably his, the stand, if you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying. I thought it was okay. I wasn't the biggest fan, but I loved all the literary references. I mm -hmm. thought it was quite brilliant in that way. Yeah, no, I agree. So you are writing yet a third book in the Gwendy uh, series. Can you tell us about that one? Will that one be in Castle Rock? Um, see, I have to pick my words carefully because, uh, you know, for instance, we, we just settled on, a, on a, a tentative but most likely final title for it, um, which, I, which I'm not going to say yet. Um, what I can say is it's, uh, it's going to be, this one's going to be, unlike the first two, this one will be a full-length novel. Um, button box was a novella at around 25,000 words or so. Yeah. Um, magic feather was about double that. It was almost 50,000 words and, and they called it a novel on the front of the book, which is close. You know, some people say, you know, to be a, to be a novel it has to be 50 others say 60, but you know, whatever. Um, but this one will be a, you know, a, a legit full length, you know, novel, um, there's some Castle Rock. Uh, I'll give you some hints. There's going to be some dairy, which I'm really excited about. Um, there's, you're going to see, yeah. I mean, if you're a fan of the Dark Tower and you're a fan of, you know, the Low Men and, and some other things uh, from Stephen King Universe, yeah, I think you'll be really happy with the third volume. You mentioned Low Men, and the next thing I want to get into here, I recently ranked 47 Stephen King books here on my channel. I've read 47 so far on my quest to read them all, and Hearts in Atlantis is my absolute favorite Stephen King book. I think that just the, with just concerning the quality of storytelling itself, I thought that mm -hmm. that one was the most engrossing for me. And it's kind of rare for someone to say, Hearts in Atlantis is my favorite Stephen King book. And I saw that Hearts is actually in your top 13 Stephen King books. I'm just curious what you thought was good about that one. Um, you know, it's interesting because I, I used, when I read that and then whenever I was doing interviews for like the next several years, I would always say Hearts in Atlantis, it's not my favorite Stephen King book. It's one of my favorite, but I think absolutely some of his best writing is in that book. Um, and, yeah. and, you know, it's one of the things that, that made me fall in love with Stephen King. And I think so many other, other readers are just uh, his ability to transport you to another place in time, um, his ability to make you feel like his characters are part of your life, not just these two dimensional things that you're reading about on a piece of paper. Um, and I, and I, I just don't know that he's ever accomplished that more than he did in hearts in Atlantis. Um, you know, I was, uh, you know, back when that book took place, um, in the years that it took place, you know, obviously he lived that. And, um, I, I think, it, and it was such an emotional explosive, chaotic time i think he really captured the feelings i mean i was a little kid running around collecting baseball cards you know at mm -hmm. the end of the 60s and in the early 70s um so i was pretty oblivious to most of it i had older sisters so you know i got glimpses of that world i had a brother who was in the army so i got glimpses um but that book just it, it absolutely put me in a time machine and took me back and um, yeah I love the entire book, particularly the hearts in atlanta section where the you know all the college guys are playing cards and just the way that they kind of got lost in it. And some, you know, for some, it, it may have saved their sanity. And for others, it led them to dropping out of school and going to Vietnam. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that's, I, it's particularly hard in Atlantis, that section. I've always said, I, and I've never done this before, so I don't know why I think this, but I've always said I would love to write that, to adapt that to a play for the stage because you don't need any special effects. You don't need, and, and I heard it's going to be a movie. Which is which is wow, wonderful. but wow, for some reason I, I just always I'm I'm not a huge theater nerd. I've been you know to, I'm like the guy who's gone to see you know like uh, Les Mis and Phantom of the Opera. So you know I appreciate the the kind of magic that they do up there. Um, but yeah, so I don't know why that thought comes to me other than I just I think that 
whole section could play out so well on stage and uh, really be powerful and effective. And I'd love to write it, but. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to see you write it because that sounds like it could be a real dramatic, passionate, tear-jerking kind of story. By the way, Low Men in Yellow Coats is one of three books that I consider cornerstones of the tower, uh, Black House Insomnia and Low Men in Yellow Coats. Mm -hmm. But let's move on from Stephen King here. You actually teach writing and you're big on short stories. I myself really love short stories. I love short story collections. Um, I'm actually getting ready to narrate a poem by Edgar Allan Poe here. So I'm into short stories. Uh, can, I was just hoping that you could fill us in on your passion for writing short stories. Um, you know what, that's kind of what I, other than Stephen King at a really early age, short stories are what I kind of made me fall in love with the field. Um, and, you know, I remember reading the old, uh, like Alfred Hitchcock's Presents, um, you know, those anthologies and Twilight Zone magazine and, and Twilight Zone on television. So it was always about these these short, compressed stories. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, it was it, for me in the beginning. It, that's what it was about. It was about these short, compressed stories, you know, same thing with like horror comics, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, that's what made me fall in love with it. And when I I, I started writing as a really young kid, you know, seven, eight, nine years old. And I would write these monster stories or these war stories. You know, I was a typical kid interested in like, you know, playing war and cowboys and Indians and all that. And so I, I was the guy writing stories up in my bedroom, um, pretending I was, you know, one of the characters. Um, and that just, you know, when I started writing again in college, it's just immediately what I was drawn to. You know, I, I the idea of sitting down and starting a novel was completely alien to me. I, I knew I wasn't good enough, number one, and it was just so intimidating that I probably never would have put pen to paper. But the idea of writing a short story like the ones I had uh, come up on, yeah, that 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 was completely realistic to me. And that's just uh, kind of how I got my start. You started a company, correct me if I'm wrong here, you co-founded Chesapeake Films. Is that right? Yeah, I, uh, I went to... I grew up near a guy named John Sheck, who, uh, who, you know, in the middle of college, he decided, hey, I want to go out west and become an actor. And he, you know, he uh, he did really well and, and still is. Uh, but, yeah, long time, you know, lifetime friend. Um, he went out and he made uh, That Thing You Do with Tom Hanks and Hush with Gwyneth Paltrow and, and Jessica Lange and, and a lot of other big movies. Um, he also did like, he played Jonah Hex on, on one of these television, one of these superhero television series and, and, and has done some cool stuff. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we ran into each other one day when he was back in town and we started talking about doing something together. We, we made a short film of one of my stories called Heroes, had a lot of fun doing that. And, uh, then that led us to writing some, some projects together. We did, uh, an episode of Masters of Horror for Mick Garris, um, based on a Bentley little story called The Washingtonians. We wrote two episodes of Fear Itself for uh, NBC. Um, we adapted an Ed Gorman thriller called The Poker Club and, and had that produced independently. And yeah, I mean, we, we kind of had a really nice run um, where uh, the vast majority of the projects we wrote got, you know, were actually made into, into films or, or uh, television episodes. Um, ironically, the two Stephen King projects that we adapted from a Buick gate and uh, the black house, um, neither one of those got made. You would think, you know, we had, we had, uh, the big guy, we had legendary Stephen King and, and, uh, you know, walking at our side, but, uh, because of budget constraints. And, and at the time this was before Steve kind of enjoyed this big resurgence in Hollywood. Um, we, uh, we, we, we came close with Buick eight, um, several times, but it just never flew. So now that's, that's off with somebody else and black house. We did for Akiva Goldsman, a legendary producer and writer, um, you know, several Academy awards and, and he's a huge Stephen King fan. I still remember he, he called us on a train in Europe when he was working on the, one of the Da Vinci code movies with Tom Hanks. And he's, and he, he called John and I on a conference call to tell us how much he loved our script. And he said, I felt like he said, I read it on the train on my way to set. And it felt like I was sitting next to Stephen King. And I just thought that such a great compliment from, from a legendary guy. Um, but because of all the talisman red tape at the time, it never, never happened. So as far as you know, a lot of tower junkies don't realize that you tried to get a movie going up from a Buick eight and the black house. So 
as far as you know, is it very unlikely that those projects will ever come to fruition or what's going no, I on? Think, I think I've heard that Buick is, is, is going to happen. So I think Buick will. Um, Black House is going gonna, is gonna to be a lot more complicated and, and a lot more problematic. So I, I would say flip a coin on that one. But I, if, I had, if I was betting, I'd say you're going to see something from Buick 8, whether it's a series or a limited series or a feature film. My guess is, yeah, you'll see that within the next few years. Yeah, I'd really love to see that one. From a Buick 8 is an interesting side tale to the Dark Tower. Can yeah. you tell us something about your love for and work in anthologies? Um, again, it goes back to my love of short stories and, and kind of uh, where I, uh, you know, when I came into the field, uh, all those magazines that we talked about, you know, so yeah. short stories everywhere and anthologies sure. were also really hot. You know, that's back when Marty Greenberg and Ed Gorman and who else? I mean, now you have a handful of anthologists, you know, you have the usual suspects like Ellen Datlow and, and myself and a few others. But back then you had a bunch and Marty Greenberg was editing, you know, it seemed like a couple of months for, for years. Um, and a lot of the smaller presses were publishing anthologies as well as the New York publishers. So it's something I immediately got into. The first time I ever had my name on the front of a book was for a book called Cold Blood that I edited, which was kind of a mixture of horror and mystery stories, which was a kind of a subgenre that I really liked and enjoyed. Um, and, and, and that was brought out by Mark Zeezing press. And then that just continued over the years. I continued to do them. It was, it was an interesting way to, you know, because of the magazine, I had relationships with a lot of different authors. Um, so that made it much easier to put together, a, you know, an anthology, whereas, you know, some people kind of had to just, you know, back then there was no email. So you were writing snail mail letters and sending them out and hoping that they would say yes. Because of the magazine, I kind of had that built in network. Um, but, yeah, I love anthologies. I don't do them as often as I used to. Um, you know, the the kind of the kind of the cliche or, or the word on the street about anthologies was unless you have a Stephen King or a Peter Straub or a Clive Barker, you know, they don't yeah. sell as well as, as the next book. And they're also expensive to put together and produce. And all of that is true. Um, but uh, it, you know, I think I've edited 30 or so by now. So obviously it was, it was a labor of love there. That's good work that you're doing to, to get those out there. It is true that so many of them have been discontinued. I liked this one, and I'm in the process of, collection, of collecting the year's best science fiction. Mm. I think there were like 38 volumes of that came out, and it was discontinued some years ago, but that's just one example of something that was quite popular for a long time and over now. Yo, yeah. I mean, again, when I was coming up, there were two years best uh, horror, um, one by yeah. Ellen Dallow with a major publisher. It was the year's best fantasy and horror. And then another one from Doll Books that Carl Edward Wagner used to edit. Um, that was also year's best. And, uh, you know, now there's still a couple, but they're on a much smaller scale, smaller paperback publishers. And, uh, yeah, yeah it's, uh, I, you know, I think science fiction is, is more popular than ever. And horror as usual kind of goes through cycles of, you know, it's up and down, up and down. Yeah. I, I have one here. You just mentioned it, but the year's best fantasy. And there it horror. is. You know, mm -hmm. I really like these things, especially when they have like the uniform covers involved and mm -hmm. everything. I yeah. just personally can't get enough of those things. So I've got five questions here from viewers, Richard, uh, to sure. finish this off with. And the first one is, what was your inspiration to start writing? Um, I, you know what? I don't know what made me start writing when I was seven or eight or nine. I mean, I was I, I grew up, you know, I always tell people I grew up and, and I think this is probably the answer. Um, but I grew up in a family of readers. Um you know, my dad was a uh, retired Air Force and he was big on libraries. You know, we also lived about uh, about three blocks from our local library. But uh, yeah, I mean, that was that was a, a cool thing to do is, uh, you know, unlike a lot of kids who would like rather, you know, eat paint um, than, than go to the library. I was always, you know, I was I was a normal kid. You know, I love to play wiffle ball. And like I said, I was out there playing army and trading baseball cards and, and uh, you know, playing for the local baseball team, all that stuff. But I was just always a huge reader. And so the library and eventually the bookstore was like a treat for me. Um, I have three sisters. They all read. My mom read. Um, so I was surrounded by books. Um, and uh, I guess that spilled over 
you know, somewhere into and not just wanting to read stories, but also tell stories. I was always the kid who, who made, you know, if I was walking home with a couple friends after dark and we were going through the spooky part of town, I was always the idiot who would start telling a scary story out loud. And <laughs> my friends would be saying, Rich, shut up, stop, stop. And I'd just keep going. And then at some point I'd like look over my shoulder and pretend I saw something and scream and run away. And then they'd make me promise I'd never do it again. And the next time we walked home, I'd start again. So that, that was always me. Sure. You know, and then as far as my inspiration for hard stuff, you know, um, like I said, Twilight Zone, you know, Evan Costello movies, uh, you know, Scooby Doo cartoons as a kid. I was just always attracted to that. And then uh, when I was in college, I read a copy of uh, I was I was in college when when it Stephen King's it came out in hardcover. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I remember I spent a couple of weeks reading this and kind of savoring, you know, I, I, I kind of saved pages at the end to read because I didn't want it to end. But by the time I was finished, I was like, I want to do this, you know, uh, in some capacity, I want to be involved in this and I want to be a wow. storyteller. And That's so, a, yeah, that, was, that yeah. was kind of the the launching pad for me. You know, that's incredible that you read one of his books so long ago and it was a great inspiration for you. And then you managed to co-author with him, which is basically an unattainable height to achieve as an author. So I just think that that's very admirable that you. Oh, that you it's, to well, you know what? it's, it's nuts. I tell people. And when I, I did a lot of press <laughs> after button box and I said, look, I said, you, you, you have to look long and hard to find someone who kind of is more of a dreamer than me. Um, as evidenced by, you know, starting this little underground magazine and this publishing company when I was 22 and, and, and actually sticking with it and, you know, being broke and, you know, looking for change in the bottom and you know, the floorboard of my cars, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, I did it cause I loved it and, and, and really didn't, you know, I kind of understood really early that I wasn't going to let how little or how much money I made, you know, dictate whether I felt like I was a success. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I remember, you know, in my summer jobs, walking around with a Stephen King paperback in my back pocket. I remember, you know, climbing up in a tree and, and reading where I was when I read Christine and all that. And like I said, it was this just momentous event in my life when I read it. So, yeah, I, I would always tell people back then um, in, in the media, I'd say, you know, you, you will not find a bigger dreamer than me. But not even I ever dreamed that I would write with Steve. That was, you know. Yeah. I thought I kind of hit the pinnacle when I was public, when I was publishing his books and his short stories and, and, and was enough of a trusted friend that he would email me a book file in advance and say, Hey, you might like this one. And there I am, you know, reading a book a year and a half before anyone else got to read it. That, that kind of, that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, to actually sit down and write with him. Um, when I wrote button box, I, I, ref- we, you know, all the trading back and forth we did, I refused the, the, the original manuscript he sent me said Gwendy's button box by Stephen King. I refused to add my name to it. Uh, I, I made him do that um, because it was just too much. It was kind of too much to, to, to comprehend for me. And uh, yeah, so I'm rambling on about it, but yeah, it, it's uh, it's beyond a dream come true for that to happen. Yeah. And not to mention it's now turned into what will be a trilogy and who knows where it might go from there. So I commend you on your work yeah, with thank Stephen you. King. Thank you. Viewer question number two, what, uh, which is your favorite nonfiction book? My favorite nonfiction book of, of all of them that are out there. That's really hard. I, I don't know that I can give, I, I, I might have to cop out and say, I don't know if I can give a specific answer, but yeah. I do read a lot of nonfiction. Um, and I go through streaks with, with, with the topics. I read a lot of true crime books. Um, I really like true crime. Um, I read a lot of history books. Mm. Um, I, uh, when, again, growing up and it's just stuck with me, I was really interested in, 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 uh, you know, different, the different, uh, wars, uh, the old West. Um, so I read a lot of history books and I read a lot of like outdoor type books, uh, you know, whether it's about Everest or mountain climbing or, uh, you know, again, that kind of crosses with my true crime interest because there's a lot of books about people who have gotten lost and, and, you know, never resurfaced and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I love true crime. I don't know what my favorite is. Maybe, you know, maybe, uh, you know, that book, the perfect storm about the, uh, the lobster men off Gloucester, you know, 
I think I'm pronouncing that right, in, in Massachusetts who, who, you know, were lost in a big storm um, or one of the Everest books about the tragedies on Everest or, or the triumphs on Everest. That, that's just, uh, you know, reading about real people who, who live through these experiences has is, is always been fascinating to me. Let me squeeze one more question here of my mm -hmm. own real quick. Have you or would you ever consider writing a book on writing? Not on writing. Um, there's too many good ones out there, you know, including King's on writing and, and some of the others. Yeah. But uh, and, and honestly, um, you know, I've said this before and, and people will come back and say, oh, you're, you're very humble. You're very, very modest. And I always just kind of giggle and say, no, I'm just very honest here. Um, I'm not. A, you know, that's the interesting thing. I'm a, I'm a meat and potatoes kind of a writer. You know, I, I don't get into I'm not you know, no one's going to mistake me for a great stylist. Um, no one is going to mistake me for an elegant writer. Um, I think I'm a, I'm a good storyteller. Um, uh, I still think, you know, for the most part, I'm that kid sitting around a campfire telling his friends stories. Um, I, uh, you know, one of the things I fell in love with about fiction writing is that you can kind of break the rules. You know, I felt so restricted in all the grammar classes and all the uh, specific English classes that I had. And I remember one of the things that I, that I really, enjoyed about when I started writing my own fiction is, is you could break rules and you could play around with grammar and you yeah. have sentence structure and paragraph structure, and you could start a sentence with the word and, and not get yelled at. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would be the wrong person to write a, to write a book about writing, or even I'm pretty much the wrong person to read a book about writing. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I just have kind of, you know, self-taught and did my own thing. And, and, you know, I have gone to writing conferences and, 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 te and taught and uh, enjoy doing that. Um, and I love it. I love the editing process, working with other writers and, and kind of helping them along. But it's always, I, I always focus on, on the pretty basic aspects of storytelling and narrative drive and pace and character and those kind of things, as opposed to, um, you know, the real, real hardcore nuts and bolts of, of that. I, I've always been one of those guys who doesn't kind of want to look under the hood too carefully. Cause uh, I, if I, if I figure it out, I'm liable to, to, you know, change my style and, and change my approach, which, which I don't want to do. Fair enough. All right. Number three of five here. What in your opinion are the most important elements of good writing? Oh, you know what? I just, I just mentioned that uh, for me, it's, it's that narrative drive, um, that ability to, yeah. uh, to build an engine to a story and keep it going. It doesn't mean that it needs to be super fast paced. You know, I like plenty of stories that are on the quieter side and, and are more leisurely and they're telling, but it's, uh, it's building that narrative drive engine that, uh, takes, takes you from one scene to another and, yeah. um, compels you to finish reading the story. I mean, if that's one thing I can tell writers after doing this for 30 years on a edit, on the editorial side of the desk is, if your story doesn't make me want to keep turning the pages, I won't. Yeah. You know, those first three or four years, I used to read every page of every story that was submitted. Um, every page of every story that I picked up, a you know, an anthology and, and read. Um, but after a while, you just stop doing that because time becomes too valuable and too short. And uh, yeah, if it doesn't make me want to keep reading, if it's not interesting and it's not compelling and it doesn't have that engine, then I'm going to put it down and go to the next one. Um, and other than yeah. that, if for me, it's the characters, it's, uh, you know, make me care about them. I, I don't have to love them. I can hate them, but if I'm indifferent again, uh, chances are I'm going to put it down. Yeah. Stephen King says something along the lines of the author has to make sure that they don't drop the ball, so to speak on keeping the plot rolling. Mm -hmm. And I agree with that. And there are a lot of techniques like that. Uh, James Patterson uses the short chapter technique and the cliffhanger technique. Uh, but I agree that suspense is extremely important, if not vital for me when it comes to enjoying a novel. Right. And, I, and no. I, just because, sure. just because hopefully you have some, some, some writers who are, who are listening, but um, yeah, I learned a really valuable lesson from a writer named Ed Gorman. Um, yeah. I read one of his books. It was a Western. Yeah. Yeah, and Ed is a Ed was he's no longer with us, um, but he was he he did a lot of anthologies with Marty Greenberg, and and he was a really well known, well respected uh, crime, mystery, suspense, horror, western, and even wrote some science fiction and fantasy. He was a writer's writer. The guy could just write, um, yeah. 
not a not a like a master stylist again he was he was he used to say i, I write fiction for you know guys who, who carry their their uh their lunch and lunch pails to the to the factory and that kind of thing um but you talk about someone who never gave himself enough credit that was ed gorman um but the, the lesson i learned from reading his work that i honestly believed helped me um you know kind of develop into the writer i am now and have that confidence was that every story you didn't have to reinvent the wheel. You, it, it was they weren't all about these these twisting plots and these uh, you know complicated storylines. You could write about the guy who was sitting on the bench at the bus stop waiting for the bus, and you could write about what his circumstances were. You, you could write these small yeah. stories that mattered to, that that you could do them so well that they would matter to people. Um, and that's a lesson that I learned. And, and once I stopped trying to reinvent the wheel with every story, that's when I kind of found my voice. And I think that's really important for writers too. And I think that's really important, particularly in short stories. You know, that's a good point that I'm going to keep in mind because I myself have dabbled with trying to write a short story and I find that it can be a real challenge, but I'm going to keep that in mind that you can write about something that's just an everyday thing and, and make it something. So I'm going to, to ponder that. After, yeah, I, I, after I, that. I've said it in my collections, find something that is, that is meaningful to you, you know, whether it's a yeah. person, a place, or even this, just this moment in time that might, that you might not have enough confidence to think uh, this is worth putting down on paper and kind of throw that doubt out the window and write it. And, and honestly, I, I think that's where you end up finding something special at, over time. Number four here, which book that you've written is your favorite and why? Um, you know, I do get asked that question from time to time and I always want to change my answers. And then I always realize that I really can't because if I'm being honest, you know, there, I could say, you know, a long December was a collection of stories that, that I wrote over a period of 20 years. So that might be the highest quality or maybe it's, it's, you know, Wendy's button box. Cause I, I, you know, as you highlighted, I got to write with my literary hero and, and how often does someone really get to do that? Um, yeah. But if, if you're just saying, hey, Rich, what's your favorite book? What 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 holds the most special place in your heart? Um, it's got to be Widow's Point because I wrote it with my son. Um, hmm. You know, Billy is uh, he just turned 22 last week and um, we wrote this together when he was, what, 19 or 20. Um Again, just like I never really dreamed of writing, of, of, of sitting next to Stephen King and writing. I never really dreamed of, you know, I have two boys. I love them to death. They're great kids. Um, and uh, But I never really dreamed of writing with one of them. So Billy and I have written a couple short films together. We've written some short stories together. And then we wrote, you know, this Widow's Point um, novella and just had a blast doing it. Um, and uh, it, end, it ended up being turned into a film. And uh, it's just, yeah, that, that's kind of a dream come true project in a different way. And uh, yeah, that's if, if you ask what my favorite is 20 years from now, I, I think I'll be hemming and hawing and coming back and saying, oh, it's Widow's Point. All right. The final one I've got for you here is, is one that's that I'm quite curious about. Which genre that you, uh, which genre is your favorite to write in other than horror? Um, I would probably say, I would probably say the crime thriller genre. You know, it's what a lot of my stories are. It's I think because I publish so much horror, people expect what I've written to be horror. And and Widow's Point, which I just talked about, is a ghost story. It's the only supernatural story I've written in thirty years. So it, wow. that is certainly horror. Um, the Girl on the Porch and so many of the other, you know. Uh, Gwendy to me is like a dark fairy tale. It's, it's not really hard. Yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, it's a tale of the fantastic and, and, uh, um, you know, I, I think it's really stretching it to call it horror. So yeah, for me, most of my work, I think falls into the crime thriller genre. Um, and it's just about everyday people whose, whose lives have, have changed kind of uh, at a drop of a dime. That, that was a, a theme that, once I started putting together my own collections, I realized that so many of my stories really are about everyday people put in extraordinary circumstances um, and everyday people who, who are living pretty, uh, pretty normal, relatively happy lives where everything changes on, uh, you know, on this moment in time and, and their life becomes something else. 
Fair enough. We're out of time here, Rich. I appreciate you joining me. And for the viewers, if you're still with us, down in the description will be a list of everything uh, that you can get from Richard, uh, everything that he's worked on with Stephen King, all of the anthologies. I'll put it all down there in the description, as well as the link to the website. Uh, website. Richard, thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Take care.